Yeah, to my land, I built my first shack real close to my neighbor's property while I was building my house. And about five feet away is where he kept his chicken coop, and that's where Harry the Rooster lived. So this one's called Harry the Rooster. <clears throat> Every cowboy worth his salt, hard working, honest, you know the sort, has been awakened in the early morn by something louder than his old Ford's horn. He does not care whether friend or foe, and only really wants to know is how we can turn it off or shut it up. Is there a cat on the roof and now it's stuck? It screeches and hollers all through the morn like that old windmill during a storm. You grab your pillow and cover your head. Grab your cover and hide under the bed. It's Harry the Rooster up before dawn, belting out his daily song. To him it's his job and he does his best to make sure this cowboy don't get enough rest. If I had my gun, I'd shoot it at him. I know, I know that's a deadly sin. A wicked cowboy up early, he's liable to shoot. As it is, I have to go hunting my old left boot. <laughs> that was great. Karen, did you have one too? I have she's a coming, Sheriff. <laughs> one more poem. Okay, this is a poem by a, a cowgirl, and her name is Duet Five. <clears throat> it's called Breakfast in a Cow Camp. You're rolled up in your bed and sleeping on the ground. Rattlesnakes don't bother you, nor nothing hanging around. You hear somebody stirring, and that old cook kicks the pup. It's still dark as blazes, but you know it's time to get up. It's cold and you lay there thinking, the boss has got the crust. You think you can't make it, but still, you know you must. So you just reach for your overalls, you take another smell. Yep, it's the coffee brewing. Gosh, won't that be swell? You wash in ice cold water, the T-bones are frying now. As the cook says, come and get her, you're right there for the chow. There's good old sourdough biscuits and plenty of gravy too. Why, you've never tasted nothing like that. And when you're through, you go out and rope your horses in the early morning dew. Then you saddle up in yonder where the sky is streaked with blue. We'll be getting there at sunup where there's plenty of work to do. And Jimmy, did you have more? It was Bill. Jimmy Gummer? No, sir. Hi, Elizabeth. How things in Paris? Um, I used to write a lot of capital poetry and I haven't done any in a year and I haven't performed any in public in a long time, but since everybody's doing one, I thought I would do, do this one I wrote a long time ago. And by the way, my why hates this one? It's called the Queen of the Dude Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a little story about the Circle Bar Z, the best little dude ranch you ever get to see. Now the ranch was run by old Gilbert McKay, a hard-working cowhand with not much to say. He had been in that ranch for some 30 odd years, and he'd sure seen it all, so say his peers. Because dudes are the sources of endless mistakes. Now I'll tell you all about one that sure takes the cake. One time to the ranch from a pretty young lass, straight from New York in green as the grass. She had natural blonde hair and she walked with a wiggle, and the curves on her body all seemed to jiggle. <laughs> One day, Gil asked that gal for a favor to melt the old Holstein so it's tasty and savor. She said, Well, I've never done it, but can't be much to it. Just give me that bucket and I'll go and do it. Well, until the end of the day that the gal came back in, all dirty and bloody, like a fight she'd been in. She said, I pulled on her leg and I got her to hike it. By the time I was done, she sure seemed to like it. She said, I, I haven't done this in a long time, so I'm gonna, uh, It took me all day, but I didn't fail. I tried and I tried and I filled up that pail. Well, the gal asked her to show her the cow that she made. When she pointed around, he, Dunn flipped his lid. 
because soon after I was the king of the place, all taller than all with a smile on his face. <laughs> Thanks. That was great. <laughs> oh, has anybody got a one minute history? Okay, not tonight, and that's good. Okay. We're ready for break time. Let's grab a snack. Hit the boy in the room if you need to, or the ladies' room as the case may be. And let's be back in here for the sound of the cowbell in five minutes or so. <laughs> Yes, sir, I'm going to take it. Thank you, Gary. In the uh, fall winter border vedettes, this article was published for the corral. So um, if you're interested in this, you should have it on your uh, uh, file or an email from Doug. And I printed it out just in case I want to read some quotes or, or something. So uh, with that, uh, we're looking at one of the posters, and I find it fascinating that they spend the money to colorize the, the photos back in the, in the day for the posters. Well, let's see if I, if I can get this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, does it go on the pointer or the pinky? Or pointer? Any figure you're comfortable with, but. Okay. Um, Greg, do you want lights on or off? Um, I'm fine with them on, but if you, if you want them off, you can turn them off. Alright, so facing it toward the laptop. Okay. Alright. So the movie was written by the, the director of the film. Uh, I think he must have known the backstory on these big cattle drives that happened in New Mexico, Arizona in the 1920s. I'll just go ahead and tell you right off the bat that um, the 19-teens were years with plenty of, of rainfall in New Mexico and Arizona, but then when the 1920s roll around, we're into a drought period, and uh, these ranchers end up having too many head of cattle with not enough grazing land or not enough grass to feed their herds, and they end up uh, pooling their resources together and sending quite a few head, thousands of head on trains, as well as the good old fashioned, um, just moving the cattle, droving the cattle into Chihuahua, um, where there was plenty of grass, and, uh, I haven't really investigated this in great detail on Chihuahua, but can anybody guess why there was plenty of grass in Chihuahua in the early 1920s? Civ uh, revolution, Civil War, Pancho Villa wiped out the, the, the native ranchers, uh, probably ate all the beef that they could to survive those armies, and so when sort of settled into Mexico, there's all this lush grass, and they're actually beckoning the, these uh, drought-stricken ranchers to come into me to Mexico. Well, anyway, so uh, Earl Hudson decides to write a screenplay about this real-life event, some of the biggest cattle drives that had ever occurred. And instead of making Mother Nature the villain in in his novel, in his screenplay, 
He goes with the uh, the people pushing out the big ranchers are the nesters, the small time farmers, the small cattle growers, as well as all things the utility companies. The I guess we would say the electric companies bringing in lines, buying up so many acres on either side, maybe of, the, of those um, of those electric lines. But so he, he blames the, these troubles for the ranchers on the smaller pioneers moving in to the southwest. And uh, once he gets his screenplay written, at the same time he hires a writer to, to write uh, the novel. And so here we have the dust cover for the novel Sundown. Uh, I, I kind of keep it hidden in the actual article, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you the little secret that this movie no longer exists. As you know, celluloid, very flammable, um, was it the nit nitrate or nitrite? Nitrate on the, the film that was very combustible. Uh, this film would actually, uh, celluloid would actually burst into flame just uh, through the hot cam uh, light and lens as the movie was being shown, these kinds of movies. So, uh, so far it's no longer with us. And I, I find it fascinating that the novel, it doesn't even have the two stars of the movie on the cover. Um, does it have a laser, this thing have a laser on Yeah, there? it's that top button. Oh, because I have it on backwards. <laughs> That's probably the reason. Be well, careful, you'll kill yourself with a laser. <laughs> Okay, so the star of the, the female lead is Bessie Love. That's not Bessie, and you really can't see it in this, but uh, Roy Stewart is the lead male character, and that's not Roy. So I guess, the, I think the novel must have come out uh, relatively at the exact same time as the movie. We'll get into that. Now I see why the forward button is correct when it's done this way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had to add the hearts, but this is the opening photograph in the novel, and that is Bessie Love with the, the cowboy lead in the movie, Roy Stewart. And um, the novel Sundown opens with this sentimental still of the two main characters, Hugh Brent and Ellen Crawley. That's the names in the novel for these characters, and they are actors Roy Stewart and Bessie Love. Wow, uh, Hudson went all out. Um, he spent at least a half a million dollars on this movie, or his his uh, movie company, and he hired a slew of great screenwriters to to work on this movie. And I'll just throw this out, a little you know, a little little secret that uh, I probably shouldn't divulge, but I think this is a case of too many chefs spoil the pot. Uh, he, he spends all this money on screenwriters, and I'll get into them. <laughs> there we go. All right. Francis Marion, one of the well-known Sundown screenplay authors, and Mary Pickford's best friend. She wrote a lot of great movies. Can't think of any. I didn't memorize those ahead of time. Another one, uh, A Giant Among Writers for Early Motion Pictures, Marion Fairfax. Uh, she actually had a, a full health breakdown at about this time working on, on this movie and working with Mr. Hudson, Earl Hudson. And uh, I, she never recovered. And I'm not sure if it was uh, nerves or what broke her spirit, but uh, I think this movie had something to do with it. We also have Kenneth B. Clark, who was a screenwriter. Uh, he worked for the Saturday Evening Post, had written quite a few westerns, and in fact, uh, this particular newspaper article came from 1918, so six years before sundown, he was writing movies for Roy Stewart, who will be the lead in this, in this movie. Now this isn't your typical Western because it was current events. And Hudson made sure we all knew that with the biplanes that are seen in the 
placards that were posted around the United States and in Europe where the movie went on tour. Um, yeah, they, I think he wanted to push it to the public that, you know, this isn't uh, history. This is what just happened. And that's why the, the uh, biplane is in both of these. All right, it, the movie had a huge cast because you had ranchers, you had small uh, mercantile owners uh, that would have to be played in the movie. But we, can, can, can we, can everybody read those names? Like Bessie Love at the top, it, it looks a little blurry. I, I think I'll skip through this because we're gonna see most of these actors and actresses uh, individually. Roy Stewart, he was a cowboy screen legend until the film industry switched from silent movies to the talking pictures. He took smaller roles after the sound photo, uh, movies came into being and he ends up dying early in 1933. But he had made hundreds of small pictures. This is the star, the female lead of the movie Juanita Horton, who had, changed, had her name changed when she got into the business in 1950, she became Bessie Love. Um, Bessie, because her name Juanita Horton, the industry thought was too hard to pronounce. Can you go figure? Uh, Bessie, because any child could pronounce Bessie, and love, because we all want to love Bessie Love. Okay, uh, I found it fascinating. Uh, actually, I became enthralled with studying Bessie Love, of all things. Uh, she, she was a pretty face at, at the time. Um, but in her autobiography, she said she grew up in Midland, Texas. Okay, that's strange because when I investigate Bessie Love, Juanita Horton, on the genealogy websites, I come up with things like uh, her, her mother, Jenny, was living in Silver City, not too far from here. You know, just a couple of counties over in New Mexico from Cochise. And uh, even though Bessie Love in her autobiography, she's talking about, well, I went to school in Midland. Uh, there's something not right because this is her family uh, in both of these family search entries. John, John Cross Horton is her father and in 1920 they were in LA. She was already in a, a hit in the movie industry and then here in 1900 she was two years old and living in Silver City. The father of Roy Stewart's character in the movie was played by Hobart Bosworth. Uh, this is a very nice portrait of him taking the very year of the movie. Uh, Bosworth has quite a uh, rags to riches story in and of itself. He basically grew up on his own. His father was uh, one of these hard fathers, slapped him around. He, he uh, left home and like 20 years later, his dad saw him on a wharf and said, ah, you're too big for me to handle now. And so Bosworth was a tough character. He developed TB, I believe it was TB, and had to move to Arizona to regain his health. And so he lived in Phoenix, the Phoenix area, in the 19 teens, and actually did recover quite a bit from his early uh, sicknesses. And I wonder if he may have been the the member of Hollywood, of Hollywood that knew Cochise County. And the Hortons, may, uh, Juanita Horton or Bessie Love's family may have passed through here as well. And this is the star of Sundown with uh, Hobart Bosworth in a movie in 1921, The Sea Line. And again, they colorized the, the, the poster. 
Charles Murray, he, he plays the camp cook in the movie. Charles was a member of the Keystone Cops before going on to, to doing more straight roles rather than comedy, although he never really gave up the comedy angle. And we'll see that a little bit later. So the crew first started filming in West Texas. We don't know exactly where that is as far as I know because this was a very desolate region. There weren't any towns. You can see that I placed the, the red X for where they filmed near Dell City, Texas. Uh, well, it's a little blurry up there, but Dell City is where the laser is pointing at. And it wasn't founded until 1948, I believe. So we're talking 1924. There, we don't know where they filmed because nobody paid that much attention at the time. Very desolate. It was probably on somewhere filmed on, on top of the Otero Plateau. Is that, has anybody heard of the Otero Plateau? Otero Mesa. Otero Mesa. Sundown's camp at the cold and windy West Texas shoot in March 1924. This photograph is from Bessie Love's autobiography. And they were trying to film in a March snowstorm. I, I would almost call it a March blizzard. It shut that blizzard shows up in the New Mexico newspapers at the time. And they were dealing with dust. Um, by the way, I'm no expert at, at wireless communication, but I think uh, I think we're looking at um, telegraph wires possibly leading to all of the, the tents. So they did have some communication to the outside world. Oh. They wrapped up in Texas and I, I don't, well, I actually read where they went back to California, recouped a little bit and then came out to Arizona in April. But I'm not sure that that works out. I think Bessie, her, her memories were a little bit foggy when she wrote her autobiography in the 19. 70s, so it makes sense to, to get on board the Southwest, the El Paso and Southwestern Railway and just come on over to Douglas. And while in Douglas, they did some filming uh, at, a, at a local church. I, I don't think there's any existing photographs of, of that, uh, all of any of their filming in Douglas. Uh, but they also advertised in the newspaper that they were going to go out to one of the railroad sidings along the El Paso Southwestern uh, to Chiricahua or Chiricahua Station. And so the map shows that Douglas is right on the border and then Chiricahua is uh, right here. And it's now just to the west of Highway 80. And that would be a dirt road off of 80 that goes to Rucker Canyon, Camp Rucker, uh, Tex Canyon. And so I'll show you what's left of Chiricahua or Chiricahua Station. <laughs> there is a crumbling sidewalk that we can see goes up to the railroad bed that still exists, and then the cistern that gave water to the to the steam engines and uh, that's basically it for what we we know i'm sure there's local ranch families that have photographs of when there were buildings at chiricahua i just haven't i, I called the lo local ranching families to see if there were any records of their family receiving money to loan to lease their cattle herds for the movie and nobody has a clue uh, no no recollections of this event whatsoever but it obviously happened it's in the newspapers it's in Bessie's autobiography from the 1970s just to get our bearings uh, if you're familiar with Douglas uh, this peak right here is College Peak which would be what maybe eight miles ten miles north of Douglas and so we're looking south from Chiricahua with this slide the next one, we're looking uh, southwest of Chiricahua Station across 80 Highway. And I, I'm photographing 
erecting these hills because the newspaper says, as well as Bessie Love, I believe in her autobiography, that they took the movie cameras and hiked up a, a mountain, they call it the mountain. The Chiricahuas are much bigger and I don't think they would have hiked a, a mountain with that heavy equipment to photograph the large cattle herd. So I, I, I would guess that they climbed one of these hills and photographed a herd of up to possibly 5,000 head, 7,000 head. That's, Bessie claims 7,000 in our biography, but I'm not sure that could be. Yes, Bill? You said this is looking southwest. Do you mean southeast? You're right, southeast. It is southeast. And let's see. Uh, over here, we can just barely see. That would be the Palencia Range or the Mexican, Mexican equivalent, which would be the Guadalupe's. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so. Just to the north of this would be Skeleton Canyon where Geronimo and Nietzsche surrendered in 1886 in September. Just, what, uh, 38 years prior to this filming. All right, so hope I get this right. This is a photograph of the nor of northeast of Chiricahua, another set of hills. Um, they don't look, they're not as tall as some of the hills, so I doubt that they climbed that, that they probably went for this next one. This is my favorite for the candidate of filming the cat and the cattle, right there. And first national pictures filmed a large herd of cattle from a mountaintop in the San Bernardino Valley. The lone hill in the center to the west of Chiricahua Station is a candidate for hosting a movie camera 99 years ago. Um, the mountain range we're looking at behind is the Chiricahuas, and I, that looks like a good candidate to me, and I've got a bit of a close-up. It doesn't look that formidable, but it's taller than most of those other hills in the area. And here we're looking north. Uh, because we have Squaw Mountain, which is probably going to get renamed soon. <laughs> uh, and uh, north of there would be Rodeo, New Mexico, and then Portal, Arizona, Portal, Cochise County, uh, to the north and west of there. Well, we have this shot from the novel that I think was probably shot right there at Chiricahua. Um, there's nothing to define that that's the spot. Uh, I tried to check out the uh, telegraph or telephone poles that are that the one that's in the frame there, and they they've changed. I mean, this one actually looks old in 1924, so I'm guessing they may have even changed those out before the railroad shut down. And I believe it was 1961, but. The Douglas newspapers, the dispatch, is asking for locals to act in this big scene where the, the railroad is stopped. Uh, First National Pictures hired two separate engines and trains to show up at the station on the same day. It must have cost them a, a, a god of money. And here, here we have Bessie Love doing a promotional. Uh, it, this is probably the time I need to tell you a little bit about the novel. So, uh, in, in the novel, these New Mexico ranchers, they're about ready to go under. So they send two representatives to go back to Washington, D.C. and talk to politicians into saving their, their spreads. And on the train ride back, uh, the good-looking young cowboy, He's, he uh, bumps into this young, uh, good-looking uh, city girl that has decided to move out to New Mexico and start uh, a homestead, and, and that's Bessie Love's character. And uh, they don't get along. Obviously, they don't like each other at first. And um, he doesn't like her because she's steal, she's robbing the land, and she doesn't like him because he's a big muscly cowboy and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right i just threw this in because i'm going to throw in all the photographs in the novel 
Well, the other ranchers aren't too excited about that, but they finally come around once they debate and weigh their options. They don't have a lot of options. Again in the novel, this is uh, Charlie Murray talking with the local cop about, hey, you know, I, I'm not making a lot of money here in this cafe, uh, and, you know, your law enforcement job hasn't been uh, catching many criminals lately. Let's, let's become cowboys. And so that, that's what happens. All right, another little uh, oddity in the novel and shows up in the movie as well is uh, they have a flashback to when the ranchers went to Teddy Roosevelt and asked him to help them keep their land. And Teddy says, well, I believe in the Constitution and, uh, you know, everybody has a right to buy land and sorry, you're, you're out of luck. So they had to throw Teddy Roosevelt. And that's played by a British actor, by the way. Teddy's part. Another poster. The quote in this sundown poster says, the cattle kings are leaving for Mexico as the father actor Arthur Hoyt, whose brother is one of the directors of the movie, and Bessie Love look on from their homestead in New Mexico. And I, I'm not sure I show this in any slides, but the, the rancher's giant herd of cattle actually stampede the Crawley's shack and destroy it. I mean, level it to the ground, raise it, and has to follow along with the cowboy, with the ranchers uh, on their trip. Well, love does kind of come into play. Well, love. That's, I didn't mean that as a joke. Okay, so here's a poster. Um, March 9th, 1925 at the Orpheum Theater in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And I'm not going to read the whole poster, but they were really hyping this movie up. And it probably was a grand movie at the time. Uh, Bessie Love <laughs> being attacked by Allosaurus. This happens uh, the next year. Which is, this is, this is really something because The Lost World, written by Arthur Conan Doyle, um, I think sets the stage for, for King Kong, and you have Bessie, young, vulnerable, beautiful girl, uh, somehow uh, pitted against many woman eating dinosaurs. <laughs> that's good, she's counting? No, no, this, that's not good. Well, yeah, it is. You're right. Mastodons and stuff. All right, so I had to throw in a little bit of King Kong, just because I'm going to get into one of my favorite topics about Hollywood, um, how sex sells. So, here we have a young Craig McEwen watching the late night movies back in 1976, age seven. Um, I remember this really strong, strong feelings for Faye Ray at age seven. And so Hollywood knew how to tap into the male psyche. And, and now we have a movie, and I'm not trying to sell this movie. This is out right now, Babylon, a movie about Hollywood transitioning from the silent era to the talkies. And I didn't mean anything by transition. <laughs> Just that that's cool. You're going from one to the other. And uh, it's not a good movie. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's flopping at the box office, but it, it really hits hard on that sexual element of Hollywood and all of the seediness. And so I'm going to get into some more of that backing up to Sunday. Because we have screenwriter Frances Marion, we showed her earlier, she writes in 1930, I spent my life searching for a man to look up to without lying down. 
And poor Bessie even, I think, got um, exploited a little bit. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks Sr. looks like he's having too much fun. <laughs> and so I, I didn't go in this angle with the, the actual hard copy story, but um, I found this fascinating in an article that was written up about Bessie Love in 1917. And I, I'll try to read this to you because it could be a little blurry. Um, Eleanor Maxwell wrote uh, seven years before sundown about Beth, the young Bessie Love who had hit big in 1915. She says, the little scream star who is not yet 18. Well, that's a lie. She was 18 and going on 19. And they knew it. <laughs> so right there you have some exploitation in my opinion. I mean, that's just how it is. Oh, oh, and she's taking voice lessons from the great Constantino. And he is uh, now resident in, in Los Angeles. Eleanor Maxwell agreed with him when she heard her sing. Somehow it brought tears. Well, the thing is, I never heard of Bessie ever singing again. So I think there was a joke about the tears but here, here's where I get into a little bit of philosophy on the other side of this article. Bessie loves everyone, said her mother, and she does not seem to know fear. That is what we wanted and sought to cultivate most of all. And it always seemed to be natural to her, not even to know evil. Uh, what a weird thing to say. You don't want your child to know evil. You're, you're going to be... You, She's going to be vulnerable to evil if she doesn't know it. Oops. There we go. Um, same year, she had had, I would say, I'm not going to call it a breakdown, but she worked too hard and she took a little break and went back to the town that she went to school in, Williams, Arizona, not too far from the Grand Canyon. And don't forget, in her autobiography, she was born and raised in Midland, Texas. <laughs> Go figure. But uh, she went with her mother out to Williams, and they spent a week or so to convalesce and, and to just uh, enjoy life a little bit away from Hollywood. Now, I love this photograph. I, I like her socks with the, the stripes. I like the spokes on the motorcycle. I, I think we even have a cowboy actor uh, on a set there in Hollywood. This was in Bessie's autobiography. And I threw this in because I'm trying to break away from the sex thing. But see, she has her fate. She marries, uh, she marries William Hawks, who is the brother of a famous Hollywood uh, director. And I can't Howard Howard Hawks. Um, this is in 1932. By 1935, Bessie pulls up the stakes with her mother and baby Patricia and moves to Great Britain. Moves to London. She in her autobiography she has nothing about uh, the the casting couch or uh, running away from this director or that director, but. Something fishy, Move, just pulling up uh, Jenny Horton, her, uh, Juanita, Bessie's mother, leaves her husband back in L.A. and moves with the daughter out, out to uh, Great Britain, and then Bessie divorces uh, William two years after that. Oh, I should have had that. Yeah. This is the family, the Hortons, in 1926, two years after sundown. Um, it looks like um, Jane's the tallest in the family. She was a school teacher born in Kansas, and she actually had a couple of her scripts made in movie, silent movies, silent films, thanks to her connections with her daughter. During World War II, Bessie works for the war, the cause, acting, uh, doing. Um, bit parts and, and advertising for the, the British cause and, and sticks with it. She's in TV shows in Great Britain back in the 50s and 60s, but makes 
movie appearances now and then, and uh, I thought that was a nice shot of her, the Baccarat, Baccarat player in On Her Majesty's Secret Service in 1969. And she continues to act in Reds, uh, The Hunger, uh, was it the, a movie about jazz, a, a musical that you, you read about, Bill? Well, anyway, she, she uh, I believe, passes away in 1986, and she was still in movies in 1983. Um, I think I'm going to, let's see, do I need to read this? Uh, tomorrow, we're back, we're back to Douglas, the Douglas International newspaper, which folded soon hereafter, I can't remember what year, but in the 1920s. Um, tomorrow will be the last of the first national, uh, oh boy, I'm having trouble reading it. You know what I could do? I bet I could shout it out to you um, by reading it just off the, <clears throat> tomorrow we'll, we, we, we'll see the last of the first national Stars in Douglas for the oh boy, trip during which the well you know I can't read this today <laughs> today they are filming at the old Spanish church in Pearlville and I I asked a Douglas historian about the old Spanish church uh, there was no old Spanish church in 1924 it would have been less than 30 years old uh, but so that film that film footage is gone and there's no stills. Uh, Roy Stewart and Hobart Bosworth were burned about the face, although not seriously during the filming of the prairie fire yesterday afternoon. That would have been out at Chiricahua. Can you imagine lighting the native grass in April and then the actors were burned? Uh, the shifting of the wind after the fire had been started and uh, the fire was tempor temporarily out of control. <laughs> <laughs> How many days is temporary? <laughs> yeah, they, so they got they were they were burned by this movie. Oh. <clears throat> Another. Small, small blurb from the International. Uh, local dance at Spear Hall last night attracts great crowd. Movie stars appear. Bessie Love, Hobart Bosworth, and Charlie Murray here for filming Sundown. First national picture at American Legion dance. Lots of people. What's, what I find fascinating about that is the Charleston had just hit big a few years before this. Bessie Love is credited as the first person doing the Charleston on film or in, in photographs. So she could have been teaching the, the, the citizens of Douglas, Cochise County, Arizona to do the Charleston in 1924. Oops. And this is it. Just one more um, advertisement for sundown from Toledo's newspaper, The Blade. Um, you heard about it, you read about it, now go see Sundown, and I wish we could. Are there any questions? It was ragtime. Ragtime, she was in ragtime. Usually bit parts. Um, yes? So that 500000 that they spent on this, and our money today would probably be about twenty million. I went to the internet. It's in this article. I, I went to one of those inflation converters, uh, and I'm sorry, I forgot. But I, you know, it's definitely in the millions. Yeah. And so twenty million sounds about right. This was a big deal. Yes, it was a big, big deal. It had a, it had a good run. Um, am I a little early, Doug? I don't know. It don't matter. Well, I could read. I could read about the New York Times did a review on Sunday, and it ain't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see if 
I can find this. Ah, yes. But I don't want to read the whole thing because this thing is long. Um, okay, I'll just start where he, the critic, Morden Paul, he's famous. I, I think I've even heard his name before. He was a British critic who worked for the New York Times. And he's down on Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt being in the picture. In this sequence, E.J. Radcliffe in a frock coat and striped trousers impersonates the late Colonel Roosevelt. Now why the Brit doesn't call him President Roosevelt, I don't know. And while one naturally recognizes the character, it is only due to the eyeglasses and the imitation of Roosevelt's way of smiling. Mr. Radcliffe is not as deep chested or as heavy as the Colonel was when, we, when he was in the White House. The comedy character in this film makes a lot of unnecessary fuss over a calf whose mother is killed. The actor treats the calf with all the affection one might a dog, even to feeding it with condensed milk run through the punctured thumb of a glove. The narrative is supposed to be concerned with the efforts of cattlemen to stem the nesters and modern conveniences. The cattlemen eventually drive their great herds across the border into Mexico. The story of this production was written by Earl Hudson, who is now producing manager for First National Pictures in the Bronx studio. It was directed by Lawrence Trimble and Harry Hoyt. Bessie Love does the best she can do with the part of Ellen Crowley, and Roy Stewart is seen as Hugh Grant. Hobart Osworth is not, in, is not an impressive cattleman. As we heard someone say, this picture is all very well if you like cows. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's tough. Here, here's an interesting critic. Um, this is a movie theater owner who had his problems with Sundown. A very good picture, but one reel too long. It was nine reels. And I, I was telling Gene that I wish I would have gone to the internet and done the uh, reels to minutes conversions. Was this like a three hour movie or four? I don't know. But uh, one reel too long. The cattle get too big a showing. Needs correct music to put it over. Won't please young folks and flappers or fans with brains. <laughs> Tone, okay. Sunday, yes. Audience appeal, okay. Family and student class town, 4,000. Admission, 10 to 25 cents. Now, isn't that fascinating? 20, 10 cents. Probably to see it during the day. Oh, and I got, yeah, I got one more here if I can find it. It's, oh, yeah. All right. Another saddle sore New Yorker chimed in shortly after Christmas about multiple films fatiguing big city sophisticates and the working class. Those are my words. Here's the review. I'm just going to give you the last sentence. The fact is that the one theater which kept away from this orgy of cows had the best audiences. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't know you were going into a talk about panning a movie that was filmed in Cochise County. And I didn't either, actually. But, yeah, it's... Again, I wish the movie still existed. Yeah, any, uh, any questions more? Uh, Craig, I, while you were talking about some of the movies that she was in late in life. Yes. One of the, the next to the last one, some older people may have remembered it on the screen, Lady Chatterley's Lover. Okay, <laughs> yeah. She was in that 1981, I think it said, or whatever it came out. But Probably a bit part <laughs> as a aunt figure or auntie or grandma. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, I've seen it many, many. No, I'm just. No. See, there's more cows in the lab. Yeah. 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 More cows. Your reels, Craig, were probably between 10 and 15 minutes. Oh, really? So a 90 minute film, probably. Yeah. And I hold out hope, and some of you may know this about celluloid film that that archaeologists and treasure hunters have found reels of celluloid film in permafrost dumps like in Arctic towns. This, this film made its way through Scandinavia. I'm, 
I'm hoping that some <laughs> small fishing village in Norway has, has, has a dump where, and they probably love cows in Norway because they have reindeer. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be a comedy, <laughs> but I'm glad, I'm glad we got some laughs. I actually worked quite, I worked quite hard on, uh, let's see, where is it? That one. <laughs> uh, that, that's me as Billy the Kid right here. And, but it's, you know, seven-year-old Craig uh, discovers women. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Well, it, it, possibly because it's extinct or it, it, it no longer exists, but... Uh, yeah, that's not a good sign for the, for the movie. I read the novel and it was a little tough to get through it. Uh, lots of cliches. Um, oh, uh, so, somewhere near Socorro, they cross the Rio Grande, and uh, a prairie fire develops. Of course, that's the prairie fire that burns Roy Stewart at Chiricahua. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, so the, the prairie fire is in the movie, it's in the novel, over by Sapporo, and Roy Stewart, well, the character uh, Hugh Brent, uh, is, he's running, he's falling off his horse, he's being choked by smoke, flames are burning at his back, and he, he lunges, into the Rio Grande River and the river saves his life. He didn't know the river was in front of him, but he just had to fall in. Well, so he's, he's burnt. He goes back to the camp and this young woman whose house has just been stampeded in her shack by the cowherd, she sees his burnt muscles and his, he's so uh, partially naked and, and beaten up by the flames and she falls in love with him. And she she uh, tends to all his wounds and bandages him and, and that's when the, the love starts. And honestly, honest, they get to Columbus and she's thinking marriage and family and he says, I'm leaving you with this local merchant until we can get our ranch established in, Chir in, in Chihuahua. It's like, come on. This girl loves you and you're leaving her in Columbus. Yeah. Anyway, that was, the end, that was the end of the novel. So there wasn't even a kiss. They didn't even kiss. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm also thinking yeah, that the people back east are culturally different. Same as today. I mean, yeah. I'm like, they don't like cows. Don't yeah. Like cows. Oh, good point. Hell of a thing. Yeah. Well, I didn't read, but uh, read that part. But actually, in New York, there were two or three cattle movies going on at the same time over Christmas, and they were sick of it. <laughs> yes. Were you trying to tell us that she fell in love with him because he was smoking a hot? Yeah. <laughs> I sure appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, if you would, if you would, please rise and join me in bidding adios to old Joe. Adios, old Joe, you old buffalo. Look, you have to give him his cup. <laughs> <laughs>